Monday, Monday afternoon. afternoon. Theologians. 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 And we're back. We are back. A lot of distracting things that will take us off our game if we're not careful. I know. And a couple of those distracting things almost caused me to think, maybe we can push this off one more week. And then I thought, no, no, no. I desperately need this. I need to get back into the word. I need to talk about things that really are important with my brother. And so in the midst of distraction, I find at least that personally, Getting back into looking at God's word around things that are really important gets me centered again. And then that tends to calm me down and keep me from getting all wigged out because of the distractions. Yeah, I, I felt the same thing uh, because I have noticed that my um, daily walk in the word has been somewhat lax in the last few days. And with mm -hmm. all the distractions, the underlying nagging feeling is you need to be working on stuff that's important. Yeah. Not all this other stuff. So yeah, uh, those things that have distracted me and kept me out of the walk and the writing project that I have, which is a presentation mm -hmm. of the gospel, it's just kind of slid. And I have to be careful with that because it's easy to let it keep sliding. Oh, it is. I'm glad we're back in it again. We need it. And I'm, yes, we do. I'm trusting that if we need it, just maybe. By allowing people to peek into our little chat together, maybe they need it too. So I think they probably do. Fellow theologians. Not, just a reminder. <laughs> that's right. This is for you, fellow theologians. Um, and speaking of things that are really important, have you ever participated in an egg toss? Well, that's an interesting question because when I think about it, I have a vague childhood memory of a schoolyard play day outside with competition and mm. all of those things where there may have been an egg toss or it could be that I have just vicariously inserted myself into somebody else's egg toss mm. and it doesn't really affect me but I do know the process and the goal and it's interesting because I've seen kind of a variation on an egg toss mm. but it's really kind of a prank where yeah. people will say, here, you sit in this chair with this pointy object, and I'm going to throw a balloon at you, and you see if you can pop the balloon, and the first balloon pops, and the second balloon pops, and the third one's filled with water so that when it is popped, the guy gets totally soaked. So kind of a variation on the egg toss, you know, the water <laughs> balloon toss, which is, you know, or the unsuspecting water balloon toss. Interesting you should say the water balloon thing, too, because we did that one time in a 4th of July picnic that we held for our congregation one time, and they had a water balloon toss. And the same principle applies, I think. And that's where I started thinking theological thoughts, even from such a thing as frivolous as an egg toss or a water balloon toss. And the idea is the key to winning is gentleness. What a coincidence that that's our topic for today. Whoa. And that involves moving in the same direction as the egg or the water balloon for a moment until you can match the momentum and then slow its momentum rather than just slamming against it to stop it. Because slamming against it to stop it doesn't seem to work well. <laughs> that's, that's when the mess ensues. It does. And speaking of messes and thinking about how messy relationships can get, can you see a possible connection with this principle between catching a moving egg or water balloon that's about to splat and stopping the momentum of a person who is headed for some destructive behavior? Oh, of I course. You know, you've, you've got to kind of move with them as you go into that counseling process. Yeah, I think so. I think coming alongside somebody and finding things that can connect you relationally, are that's so much more effective, especially if you're very gentle with them. I think that's so much more effective in trying to help guide them into stopping a forward progress that's going to be destructive for them than it is to just come slam bang right up against them. There are times, I'm sure, when we need to be firm. And I know that we'll talk about this much later on in today's podcast about how even Jesus could be very firm and he can come hard against people at the right times in the right way. But for the most part, 
I think that we probably have missed some opportunities. I know I have in helping somebody else because I was not very gentle with them. And so I actually just kind of push them away or push them into a behavior rather than helping slow the momentum itself. So I think gentleness has a lot more to it relationally than we tend to give it credit for. I, I think you're right. As we mentioned last time, this is one of the three of the fruit of the spirit that have always been a challenge. Mm -hmm. And our, our pregame huddle last week when we were chatting a little bit about the direction we wanted to go, I was reminded of a series of books. Um, the first one was called Cain and Abel, and it sounds like a very biblical topic, but it really was about two feuding families, and Cain was the name of one leader of the family, and Abel was the name of the other. Uh. Abel was the first name, Cain was the last name, but it, it worked out so that the author could use that. But there was a subsequent book that followed that, which focused on the daughter of one of the two who was either going to bring it to a head and and have a full-blown feud or bring it together so the families could unite. And mm -hmm. it was called The Prodigal Daughter. And mm -hmm. as I think about that, having had a prodigal daughter within my own family and how gentleness was not always the first response, and we'll talk about that a little more later on, even though there was a relationship it wasn't always met with gentleness or the gentleness that it needed to help work through a lot of situations that were not pleasant for either of us. Yeah. Boy, you have just touched on a nerve, I'm sure, with a whole bunch of people. Because anybody who's been a parent for any length of time knows what it's like when we're trying to be gentle and we want to be, but we have a kid who, for whatever reason, turns out not to respect what we're asking them to do or telling them to do. And it becomes difficult. Relationships are tough. And so gentleness comes into play often. And we want to make sure that we're looking at this from a biblical perspective, as always. And so we're taking us all the way back to the beginning of this specific season to let us know that the nine qualities we've been focusing on are found in Galatians 5, 22 through 23. Let me just read that whole list again so that we can get them in context the Holy Spirit, which produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness today, and self-control. And it's interesting because there's a second half of that last verse that Paul writes about, and it, it brings mm -hmm. together the nine qualities with kind of a a meta structure that that overarches oh, yeah. all nine of them. And Paul writes in verse 23b, there is no law against these attributes. And I think what he's saying there is there's no sin in being gentle with others. Mm -hmm. You know, we've never seen a policeman go up to somebody who's really gentle and he says, hey, hey, you are being way too gentle. I'm going to have to arrest you. You've <laughs> broken the gentleness law. You're going to jail. <laughs> That's true. I've never seen a policeman do that. <laughs> um, I can't help but think about one person who leaps to mind as I think about somebody who was gentle and effective, and that was the evangelist Billy Graham. He's so effective, and I think a lot of that is because even though he was very firm in his presentation of the gospel, he was also gentle with people and in the way he came across. He was so effective. He showed up in a lot of places, including some countries where Christianity was not the primary religion, and a lot of evangelists were even banned from certain countries, but they allowed him in. So I think that many evangelists would have failed because of their approach, but Billy Graham was successful. Why is that? I think one of the things that he did so well was exuding this aspect of the fruit of the Spirit. I think he was very gentle in dealing with people. I believe it was. And I every week or you know, sometimes more than once a week, I'll go back and, and listen through one of his uh, revival or uh, his camp meeting sermons just because he has such a way of dealing with the gospel message. And sometimes it's through difficult passages, but he can always bring that back to the gospel. And I think that's something that, that we can emulate. Yeah. Because we see in the gospels how Jesus was gentle with some people even though his very own disciples often reacted very differently. Yeah. And he showed them through his actions that gentleness can be a strength in leadership. 
and a great quality to have when you're reaching out to people, even those who think differently than you do. Yeah, no kidding. I just love watching great examples of Christian leadership and gentleness really comes to mind as being one of those primary factors. And here's a contrast. We mentioned it just a moment ago. Jesus was not always gentle. I mean, he was definitely gentle with those who needed his attention. And when he was trying to build a bridge to them so that they could see the truth about his identity and come to trust him. But he was not so gentle with Pharisees and some religious leaders who were actually harming people because of their legalistic, judgmental approach. They were really religiously abusive toward people. They were hurting rather than helping others. And because of that, Jesus knew that he needed to be less than gentle with certain people because he knew that when much is given, much is required. And those religious leaders, they'd been given a whole lot. They had the law. They'd been given the prophecies in the Old Testament, all of those things pointing to him as Messiah, but they missed the miracle because they missed him and his identity. And I think the saying is also true, when you know better, you should do better. And the Pharisees knew better, but they didn't do better. And so he had to become much less gentle and much more direct and firm with them. Absolutely. You know, when we look at things that happen in our lives, you know, sometimes we'll come across somebody who just seems to make the same mistake over and over again. When we look into God's relationship with Israel, we see his punishment for them was more severe, especially as they claimed to put God first, but they kept moving away from him. And we saw that many times in the Old Testament, particularly. And in a couple of times in their history, God removed them completely from their homeland. You know, he would exile them to a neighboring country, once into Egypt and once into Babylon. And even though he is extremely patient and gentle to a point, he is also just, and he has to deal with those who take advantage of his patience, those who knew better, but they won't do better. Uh, yeah, you're so right. Israel serves as a really good example to us, and I think that's on purpose from God's perspective. We have talked about how a lot of these Christ-like attributes, like the fruit of the Spirit, show up in Paul's lists. He was definitely a list guy. And in some of Paul's lists, we see how he includes gentleness as an important quality for those who become effective in representing Christ to others. For example, he writes in Philippians, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. We also find one of those lists in Colossians 3.12, when he says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, which I think are two attributes of God's character, when he says, as those people clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Mm -hmm. And Simon Peter kind of picked up on that idea, and he echoed that idea in 1 Peter 3 second part of verse 15 and into verse 16, he said, if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it, but do this in a gentle and respectful way. And one of the things that we keyed in on so many times across all of our seasons, it seems like you have to develop a relationship with someone so that they have a reason to ask you about the hope displayed. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier to display gentleness and share your faith in Christ as the reason for your hope, as outlined in the verse you just read. It's easier to do that in the context of that relationship, because you've already got common ground. You're already to some degree on the same page, and there's a respect of opinion that develops with a relationship. That's good. That's just so logical. It makes sense. I know I've been approached a few times when I've been out in public somewhere by aggressive street preacher types who tried to jam a pamphlet into my hand, and they began asking me uh, really pointed questions, things like, if you were to die tonight, do you know whether you'd be in heaven or hell? And I got to say, I know where I would be because I am a believer. It's like, I'm on your side, buddy. <laughs> but even though I know the answer to that question, I really recoil from being just assaulted or accosted in that kind of approach. And I think that we find that a gentle relational approach is more effective for most people. 
I'm sure there are times when someone might be reached by the aggressive approach that you just outlined, if the timing is just right and that's what they need to get their attention. But in your experience and my experience, it seems like developing the trust through a, a personal relationship is really much more effective. Yeah, I agree, man. I agree. And Rick and I have also seen both in scripture and in our own experiences, how gentleness can diffuse conflict. And it's at the heart of de-escalating some pretty tense situations. You know, we've already looked at some of the New Testament passages that talk about gentleness, but this is a, a theme that we find throughout the Old Testament, but particularly in the Proverbs, and that reveals the strength displayed through gentleness. Now, these are proverbs that reveal gentleness at a very practical level. Yeah, no kidding. And speaking of practical level illustrations, <laughs> one came to mind as we were looking through uh, our talking point list. I remember when our oldest, the firstborn, who tended to inherit her father's strong-willed temperament, <laughs> she started to wind up a little walking bunny toy, and it was an older toy. And I remember learning when I was younger that you have to be gentle with toys like that because those little mainsprings can break pretty easily. And so I was saying, oh, gently, gently, you don't want to <laughs> break the mainspring. So that's when I realized that she was not being terribly gentle with that toy. But in response to her not being gentle, I was tempted not to be very gentle with her. And so all these fruits of the spirit are things that we really appreciate when we're on the receiving end. I love it when people are gentle to me, especially when I need it, but it's tough to be on the giving end, especially when somebody you're dealing with isn't reciprocating the fruit you're trying to put out to them. <laughs> so if you're being gentle to somebody else and they start being not gentle to you, that's tough. It's so easy for us to slip into some of the fruit of the flesh instead of residing in this fruit of the spirit. Yeah, and don't I know, we were talking about my prodigal daughter, and I remember a situation where we discovered that she had cut the window screen and had been sneaking out um, mm. at night after we're asleep, and I was not reacting very gently in that situation, and uh, you know, I was angry, and I was more than miffed, and... I kind of took it out on her in a very harsh way, and I know that it damaged our relationship for quite a while. Yeah, well, those things do. And it's so easy for us to go to those places, too. That reminds me, too, of a, a conversation I had with a retired cop. His name was Pete, and he had served in the Ann Arbor Police Department here in Michigan. And I asked him uh, while he was at our church helping train a safety team, I said, Pete, did you ever come across a cop in the Ann Arbor force? named Jim Stevenson. And he lit up and he goes, did I come across him? He trained me. I was his partner. <laughs> I said, oh, really? So you, you probably know him fairly well. And he said, yes, very well. He was my partner. And he, he described Jim to me as somebody that no surprise to me because Jim was a member of our church where I was pastoring at the time in another town. And he said, Jim had such a strength of character and he knew how to use gentleness as one of his most effective weapons. He could go into a really tense situation and diffuse it by being gentle. Saved him and a lot of others a lot of grief. No doubt. I mean, that's a great example of how the attribute of gentleness is a quality seen in effective spiritual leaders. Mm -hmm. And unsurprisingly, we find this in the scriptures. We go back to Proverbs chapter 25. There's a verse that says, through patience, a ruler can be persuaded. And a gentle tongue can break a bone. And I think another way of saying that is a whispered word of rebuke can reach right down into your soul. Ooh, that's strong. That reminds me of a situation, too. We, we keep reminding each other of other situations, <laughs> and I love that. But I saw this one firsthand. I saw a really effective spiritual leader who became the adult in the room, so to speak. Because a lot of times when we start escalating tension in a room and we start name calling and you know all this kind of stuff it kind of brings us down to a level of about a five-year-old feels a lot like a lot of what we see in politicians who are you know treating one another very poorly they feel like kindergartners but this adult in the room was in the room full of pastors and pastors although they're wonderful people <laughs> some of them can be 
strong-willed leaders. And when you get a whole room full of leaders, things can escalate because they have strong opinions. And this room full of pastors was starting to escalate a little bit. You could feel the heat starting to rise just a little bit. But this one beautiful situation displayed gentleness. Rochelle Davis, this pastor that a lot of people respected so greatly, is an African-American pastor in downtown Detroit. And he stood up very quietly, very slowly, and he just quoted one scripture verse. He said, be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. And then he just looked around the room at a bunch of us like a grandfather would look at his grandchildren. And then he sat back down again. That's all he had to say. He was so gentle that that one Bible verse just calmed everything down. The storm passed. People got on the same page. We went on with the meeting and it was really productive. He just turned that thing around, which fleshes out exactly what Proverbs 15, one says, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Yeah. I know that pretty much everybody can look at that first and go, uh, that's truth in action right there. Yeah. And as you mentioned before, all of the fruit of the Spirit are things that we really appreciate when we're on the receiving end, but it's tough to be on the giving end, especially when that person that you're dealing with is really not reciprocating anything that even resembles the same type of fruit. Yeah. When someone's not being gentle with us, it's easy for us to return the favor. <laughs> it's easy for us to want to return anger for anger and retaliate when that person is not being gentle with us especially if we feel like it's undeserved. Right. And that's what Paul wrote about when we, as believers in Christ, are supposed to be completely humble and gentle, patient, and bearing with one another with love. And that is a very convicting verse when we are, you know, as you said before, exhibiting the fruit of the flesh. Oh, man, no kidding. I probably struggle with this one right up there in the top five <laughs> of the ones that are the most challenging for me. It, it is easy. Uh, it's easy to slide right back into some of those old habits that are not very productive. Uh, and we see in the New Testament, Jesus has that wonderful ability to be gentle in all the right situations. But we can also see how when he has been gentle and patient and peaceful and joyful, and kind, and good. He's been all those things long enough that finally he has a long fuse, but that fuse gets lit, and it's time for him to really turn up the heat. So we know that he can display righteous indignation. Unlike us, we're not Jesus Christ, and so a lot of times our indignation is not necessarily righteous. <laughs> But with Jesus, when he really has to bring the hammer down, he does so because he is God incarnate. And especially like turning over the money changers tables in the temple courts, man, there was good reason for that. They were completely abusing everything that that temple was supposed to stand for. They had turned it into something that for them was a way to bilk people out of their money. And they were cheating other people. And he was showing them that God's not pleased with that kind of activity. So yeah, he could become very less than gentle, but when he does it, it's for good reason, and it's absolutely just. Yeah, and Paul had kind of the same situation when he was talking about the need to not be so gentle mm -hmm. when people were continually straying away from God, and when they used religion to oppress others instead of helping them to find God. And in uh, one of his letters, he basically said, I will not be so gentle with you when I show up in person. You know, we can look back probably on our own childhood when we heard, you can straighten up now or wait till daddy gets home. You know, if you haven't straightened up by then, uh, you know what's coming. And it oh, was man. Be a harsher punishment than what was going to be needed out by mom. Yep. I remember a couple of those. And <laughs> Me too. That was back in the day when it was not considered a terrible thing for somebody to use the belt on your behind. Yeah. <laughs> and. I didn't have to get it too often, but I got it a couple of times, and I got to tell you, I knew I deserved it. <laughs> yeah, and then after that, it was the mere threat of it that um, helped you straighten up and fly right. Yeah, that's true. And he struck me less strongly with the belt than he did when I got spanked on my birthday for the number of years I was alive. <laughs> <laughs> so it was not abuse. I never thought of my parent as being abusive when he used the belt on me. But anyway, that's another that's another discussion about parenting, and we might get into that at some point. But 
uh, it's a little bit to me as I start extrapolating this principle of God being gentle and patient long enough until he has to really be just and bring down some punishment. Otherwise, he would not be a just God. We talk about that a lot. It's a bit like that, because when we look in the end of the New Testament, particularly the book of Revelation, for example, and we see that sort of book ended with books like Daniel and some things that talk about the end times, we see that there will become a time when God's going to have to not be gentle, because he is a just God. And we have a chance now on earth, while the gospel is so prevalent, it's being preached and taught, if we take advantage of that, and if we put him first in our lives now— we can avoid all these negative consequences. And he wants that for us. He's trying to save us from those consequences. But if we continually reject him and turn away from him, there's going to be a much harsher punishment for those who failed to heed his gentle counsel. Because we know God is both loving and just. He displayed his gentleness and his justice on the cross at the same time through Jesus Christ, who hung there to take our place. And he did so willingly as a sign of strength. He was not weak as he hung on that cross. It took everything he had to give his life up willingly for us. And in his strength, he did so knowing that his death for us was the only way to give us life and freedom from the bondage that sin has over us because sin makes us focus so much on ourselves. You know, this might be a good time to lead a prayer for someone who might actually need to respond to that gentle call that Christ is having on their hearts right now. That's a great idea. Let me do that. There are usually, almost always, two different sets of people, and we'll talk about the second group in a second. But this first group might be, if you're listening to this right now, and you've just sort of been pricked in your heart by the Holy Spirit, and you realize, I recognize that God has been trying to be patient with me, and he's so gentle And he was so gentle to even give up his own life for me, rather than just trying to become a tyrant in my life. I see that now. I want to respond to that. You could say something like this, God, I want you to come into my heart and life. I want you to be the spiritual guide in my life to point me in the right direction. I want to get onto your path because I know that yours is the right path that leads through a life of purpose. And it leads all the way to heaven. And so thank you for that. Thank you that you are so gentle. I admit that I have sinned against you by thinking of you sometimes as not being that kind of God. But the more I hear about you and the more I read about you in your word, the more I realize just how gentle you have been. And I thank you for that. And so thank you for forgiving my sin. I want to become more like you and to take on these character qualities the fruit of the spirit that you offer me, help bring those fruit, that, that character qualities, help bring them to bear in my life so that I can be more like that to other people around me as well. And thank you for doing that. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your sacrifice on my behalf so I could have that forgiveness. And thank you for the life you promise everybody who turns to you, including me right now. I accept that. And I thank you for a life that's going to be lived for you for the rest of my life and all the way into eternity because of your love and your gentleness to me. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And perhaps it would be appropriate to pray for those who may have heard the Holy Spirit whisper a word of rebuke, and they may need to work on being more gentle with those who Mm -hmm. surround them, those whose relationships are important to them. Yeah, that would include me. And so I'll pray this. (laughs) I'll pray this on our behalf, but also for those of us who might struggle with this. And so we could say a prayer, maybe something like this. Oh, God, thank you for your patience for us. Thank you that you are gentle with us and that you instruct us. And we know that all of your inspired word is there to help us, including the fact that we need to become convicted from time to time, that we are not putting on all of these character qualities or allowing you to flesh them out in our lives the way we would like. And so we're asking you right now to help us become more effective in being gentle so that when we're tempted to not be gentle, help us to pause, have a silent prayer, allow you to speak through us in a way that you would speak in that right situation so that we can de-escalate certain situations that might be escalating and that we can be more effective as spiritual leaders in our circles of influence. 
And I know you can. I've seen it happen. I've seen it at work even recently in my life. And I thank you that in that specific case, you were uh, the one speaking to me. And it was you, your power at work that allowed me to be gentle when I was tempted to not be. And I give you the glory for that. I know that was not me. That was purely a God thing. That was you suppressing something and helping bring out the fruit of the spirit rather than the fruit of the flesh. Help me to continue to grow in that area and help me to continue looking to you regularly as we're trying to do in even these podcasts, constantly reminding ourselves of your qualities and then turning to you and asking you to bring forth those qualities in our lives so that we can be more effective in reflecting your glory to other people. We want them to see you in us. May we, in a sense, be Christ to the people that you put in our path so that they can see you more clearly. We really desire that. And we thank you that you will continue to do that as we keep fixing our eyes on you, the author and finisher of our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And as we look at how what you said works in the practical world, you know, we'll be finishing up this season, we'll be finishing up the fruit of the Spirit next time, but mm -hmm. it's not something that is then finished within us. All the time we're working through our sanctification and how I'm building on all nine of those characteristics. It's an ongoing process as we surrender those mm -hmm. things that are not pleasing to him. Uh, and sometimes that's an attitude. Sometimes that's a, a time when we speak a word that's pretty harsh. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I welcome the conviction that comes from the Holy Spirit when those mm -hmm. happen, because I know I am not measuring up in so many ways, uh, in so many times in any given week. Yeah. And we can always accept that conviction from the Holy Spirit, like a good teammate accepts correction from a coach, because a good coach will correct for the sake of helping that person reach their full potential. And so it's not meant to demean or harm. It's meant to bring out the best. And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit does in us. And so when he convicts us, it's because he loves us. And if we accept that, then he does help us become more and more like him, which is so much better. And thank you, fellow theologians, for hanging in there with us again. Let us point you toward a lot of free resources that are available on our website. That is mondayafternoontheologians.podia.com. And we do hope you'll join us for the next episode of Monday, Monday Afternoon Theologians. 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 Theologians.